If not, I'm going to ask Pastor Scott to open us in prayer. Well, you know what? I'm going to ask Brother McNeil to open us in prayer. God and our Father, Lord, we come before you this morning. I want to thank you for our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and died for our sins, was buried and rose again. Lord, we thank you for your word, which uh, teaches us how to walk daily. And Lord, as we hear your word being taught, Lord, we uh, just pray that uh, the word of God would work in us that believe and that, that to bring honor and glory to you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Turn to Romans, the sixth chapter, the tenth verse. Today we're going to do some review to a certain extent. Romans 6 and 10. Very familiar area. This is some things that we've been going through somewhat last year that I touched on, but I want to begin to kind of like detail some of this information because I want us to be like-minded. In fact, the sound doctrine, which I pray that it should be, getting it from the right place, we interpret it the right way, based on the Spirit of God, we definitely want to see if in fact this is something that can further our ability to witness to others. Romans, the sixth chapter and the tenth verse. If you have it, say amen. 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 You know what? Let's read it's 10 and 11. Romans 6, 10 and 11. Let's read. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. This passage here is so full of first-of-a-kind information, or unique, authentic information that the Apostle Paul gives to us as members of the body of Christ. In fact, one of the things that's so important about this passage is really a, a, a large portion of what the Apostle Paul bases his understanding on as he gets to this testimony that he begins to let us know about in Romans the 7th chapter. There are some truths that precede Romans the 7th chapter in Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 that are so important for the Apostle Paul to be able to understand in order for him to begin to develop his testimony and stand in sound doctrine when he does that. Now, the reason I want to share that with you and I is because if it's true about Paul, if Paul can say it in his testimony, who else is it true about? Us. And, and, and because Paul is what? Pattern. He's our us. pattern. Amen. Paul is our pattern. Because Paul is our pattern. What's true about Paul, now we have, within the dynamics of that, we understand that there's what we call progressive revelation. There are some things that the Apostle Paul did early in his ministry that when he was a child, he, he, he understood as a child, and he, when he became a man, he, he put away childish things. So we understand that there's some issues about Paul that we won't be, uh, be, won't be a pattern to us, but for the most part, when the Apostle Paul begins to develop the doctrine and begin to let us know exactly what is true about him and his walk with Christ, we often know that that's also true about us and our walk in Christ. And so today I'm going to talk about these two different topics here that... Something, the terms that I've given, some expressions that we see in the scriptures. I have association and disassociation. Association and disassociation. I want you to dwell on that for a moment because I see in the scriptures how Paul has developed a framework of doctrine that now allows you and I to have an understanding of something that we are now associated with as well as something that now we are disassociated with. Associated being that we are a part of, we have commonality with. It's something that we have in union, in conjunction with something. And then there's something that no longer is a part of who we are, no longer is a part of what God is doing with us. God is no longer holding something against us. We've disassociated ourselves with some things, and now he associates us with other things. And this is very important for us as we begin to understand who we are 
as it pertains to the spirit. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5, just so our terminology and our mindset will begin to develop at, towards um, spiritual terms that apply to this lesson today. 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Because this is something you really, I want you to really start looking at yourself and see if in fact this fits your particular case here. This is a very familiar verse again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are what? Behold what? All things become This is something that you really, really want to begin to understand. All things being passed away. Is a part of this association. We don't see this in a minute. But I want to just develop things. And all things becoming new. Is a part of your new association. And we're going to begin to lay some things out. But I want to show you how when you study the scriptures. And when you look at the scriptures. Based upon this new creature that you are. The Bible begins to develop and say things about you. In a manner that God wants you to understand them. You won't get this just based upon listening on traditional uh, Christianity that really don't rightly divide the word of truth. They're saying some things and still making it think that you're part of an equation that you've actually been disassociated with. And rather than making you understand that you've been made a part of something new. And in this case it says that, in that verse it says that you're in Christ. We never can get past that because this is what changes everything. The fact that we're in Christ, we've been disassociated with some things and associated with Christ. It's going to lay itself out just based upon what the text, just based upon what some of these verses say, based upon what the scriptures are going to say. Turn to 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to look at what Paul is saying here. 1 Corinthians 7. And we're just going to take this one and begin to develop some of the things that he says here. 1 Corinthians 7.10. Now this is the Apostle Paul. He goes on here. He says, And unto the Mary I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Now we're not getting into the doctrine of marriage or whether or not the divorce. That's not what we're making a reference to here. We're looking at something as it pertains to the Apostle Paul's words and who he says is responsible for the words that are coming out of his mouth when in fact he's in, um, in Christ and as he's being a minister for the sake of Christ. So in 1 Corinthians 7 and 10, we see that he uses this expression, yet, what? Not I. Not I. And in this case, we, we, we're going to highlight that he's talking about the words not being his. He's saying that these words are what Christ is telling you. So in other words, he's the person that is coming out of his body, but he's not taking the credit for it. He's associating himself with Christ, and the words that's coming out of his mouth are the words of Christ. We see this? This is important because this is something that we have to develop in our lifestyles. We have to know that when we're saying something, we're saying it on the behalf of Christ based upon our association with Christ, being in Christ. How do we know if we're saying things that Christ would be saying? You know, they have these things, um, uh, uh, the world has had this movement happen maybe about 15, 20 years ago. It started WWJD, what would Jesus do? You remember that? So we don't really necessarily talk about it like that because whenever they talked about it, they were talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the red letters. They were trying to establish what would Jesus do on earth today. When you and I are making a reference to what Jesus would do, we're talking about the same way the Apostle Paul is making a reference to it. He says, yet not I, but Christ. How can you and I be sure that what the words coming out of our mouths are the words that Christ would, would, uh, would reflect rather than what we would reflect? Because epistles in the King James Version. Amen. I like a very detailed Pauline epistles in the King James. And it's important that you King James Version. I'm not going 
I'm not going to sugarcoat that or gloss over that because you can go to an NIV or ASV Bible and they can say the same things out of Pauline epistles and it won't reflect what Christ is really saying through Paul. That's right. So it's important not only that you talk through the Pauline epistles, but you talk uh, Pauline epistles out of the King James Version, any other way. For the most part, that's it. So this is what we have to do. So in other words, when the Bible tells us to study to show ourselves approved unto God as workmen who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, it's for the purpose of when we say something or when we're communicating to the world, it's our associated, association with Christ, yet not I, but the words being of Christ. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I believe it's the 10th verse in that as well. We want to look at that. 1 Corinthians 15 and 10 says, But by the grace of God I am what I, what I am, and his grace was bestowed upon me, which uh, what was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but what? Grace grace of God that was it. This is important. The Apostle Paul is, is laying some things out here that you and I begin to build a framework around. Now this yet not I is not just associated with the words. Now he's associating the yet not I with the grace of God. So now when you're talking about what we have to say on a day-to-day -day basis, we are administering the grace of God to individuals. The Apostle Paul talks about as it pertains to his labor and his work. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more than, look what he's saying here. You have to see how this slight shift takes place. He says, I labored more abundantly than they are. Now, if you stop right there, you'll think he's about to brag a little bit, about a little something to boast about, right? Because it's a contrast or a comparison between him and the others and what he was doing versus what they were doing. You see that? This is something you have to be fully persuaded about. You want to be able to understand why Paul says the things he says and what's the basis on how he fully elaborates upon them. So he says it from this vantage point because in your mind, that's how you generally see what's happening. Before you really get into the doctrine, this is what he sees is happening. He realized that God has disposed some grace upon him, and because of this grace that God has given him, he sees himself laboring more than anybody else. You see that? He sees himself laboring or getting things accomplished for the sake of Christ more than anything else. But he does not leave it there. And it's important that you don't leave it there. I was listening to an individual speak one time, and it said, just because it said that um, Paul labored, he said, see, Paul did work. Paul did work, and he was giving Paul the credit. Paul did some work. Don't think you don't have to work. Paul did some work. Yes, Paul did work. We clearly do see that. But Paul does not leave it there. It's important that you finish out some things you cannot stop midstream in. You have to finish out this full, the, the full uh, verse here because it really expresses how God wants you to view any labor that's coming from you. Anything that you're doing as a result of the grace of God being bestowed upon you, this is how God wants you to interpret it and to, and to, um, to issue it out. He says, but I labored more abundantly than they are. But then he says what? Yet not I again. This term here is something that we want to look at today because it's going to be the association that we want to apply to our situation now. We're associated with Christ. We have this in common with Christ now. This is what it is. Yet not I, but the grace of God, he goes on to say here says, I labored more abundantly than they are, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was where? The grace of God was in me. This is going to come in very important. You're going to begin to see the dynamics of this new creature in a moment. The grace of God is in me. This body that we still have here, this body has 